Greetings to everybody who is um, tuning into this um, uh, webinar from across the world. And uh, I add my greetings to our three panelists this evening. Um, I don't intend to uh, provide much by way of introductory comment uh, other than to say that um, I think in all capitals in Asia, there is a razor sharp focus on what happens uh, in this election. Uh, not just in terms of the winners and the losers, but also in terms of the um, processes of the American democracy itself. And on top of that, um, the extent to which real American policy trajectories change towards the region or whether they don't as a consequence of the selection. So um, as uh, Tom said before, we always look with interest to see what uh, the American democracy throws up every four years. Uh, on this occasion, our interest levels have peaked and have gone through the other side. And so um, let's get into it. I'm gonna start with Danny and just throw a question to you as uh, someone uh, situated in Singapore, uh, someone who specializes uh, in uh, the economy. When you look at um, the possible impact of a Biden presidency, Danny, uh, when you look at beyond the headlines in terms of uh, where a Democrat administration would normally go to in questions of trade and trade liberalization or sometimes non-liberalization, what's your expectations for the region, not just on the future of the TPP or the CTPP, but beyond that in terms of the regional economy if Biden gets across the line? Over to you, Danny. Uh, thank you, Kevin, and, and greetings, everyone. Um, just to, to begin that, to answer your question, to situate it in a very concrete setting, um, when you asked about Singapore, Singapore, of course, is a nation of just 5.7 million people. But here we have 5,000 American companies operating. American multinationals have created 200,000 jobs, and American foreign direct investment into Singapore peaks out at over $250 billion, a quarter of a trillion dollars, more than, more than anywhere else in Southeast Asia. So the consequentiality of the American mm. political process is massive in our mm. thinking. But like the rest of Southeast Asia, you know, what, we're, what we want to embark on is a, it's a program of peace, prosperity, stability that allows continuing development, that allows continuing poverty reduction, that con allows the continuing sensible discussion on environmental sustainability. So it is through that lens that we look at the Trump-Biden uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. In terms of just trade alone, both candidates are probably a little bit more America first. Uh, Biden for his democratic roots, for his Democrat roots, and Trump for his Make America Great Again narrative. But the instruments with which they're going to approach this are, of course, different. Trump has settled on unilateral tariffs. Biden will probably do much more kind of import substitution, environmental standards, labor protection kind of narrative. But either way, on the economic side, we also look at what's happening in terms of the US economy itself, because the United States is not just, uh, we're all in Southeast Asia, we're all young democracies. And we look to the more advanced, more mature liberal democracies of the West as examples of how governance and democratic processes are supposed to operate. In this regard, the last year or so, last four years have been, have been sobering for us. In terms of what's happening in the US economy right now, um, debt, national debt is going to go through the roof. It's going to peak out in, under either scenario, under either administration, probably 125, 130% of GDP. Uh, it looks like there's going to be a lot of monetization of the deficit because the Federal Reserve is committed to keeping interest rates low through 2023. So we're looking at a, a, a program across the two of them that is much of a much, not entirely different, where the rubber hits the road in terms of a difference is uh, in terms of what we can expect for a stability and a continuity of the international order, of the rules-based order, of multilateralism. And it is that that we're going to be focused on going forwards. I'm happy to expand on that, but let me leave that for the time being with you, Kevin. Well, thank you for that. 
Um, we can go into the relative um, commitment to multilateralism per se on the part of the two candidates, for which there's partially a self-evident answer, which is President Trump actually doesn't believe in it, and, um, and Vice President Biden kind of does. Um, but before we go down that track, let me just follow up with one question, Danny, if that's okay. Because uh, we are in this um, uh, COVID economic reality, a COVID-induced global recession. Um, uh, let me probe you one st uh, step further, which is given where we are, and given the likely monetization of public deficits, what do you see as the trajectory in terms of corporate debt? What do you see as the trajectory in terms of that in turn triggering uh, a financial crisis of any description in the absence of further government intervention uh, to ensure that uh, corporate debt does not translate into a run on banks' balance sheets? Back to you, Danny. I think, I think the risk is real. Corporate debt, how corporate debt performs going forwards, how the portfolio of loans performs going forwards, is going to be a function not just of the interest payments on that debt, but of the, the revenues that companies, corporations across the size spectrum are going to be able to draw in. If the economy does pick up in a way that I think Trump is hanging his hopes on, then there is a potential, there, there is a good possibility that you know, large American corporations, large national corporations will be able to navigate the rocky landscape ahead. Already, parts of the world are, uh, that have been careful are turning around in their economic performance. We will not regain economic heights of 2019 until maybe 2026, actually. But growth is going to be a factor going forward. Growth will be very uneven across different parts of the world. We already see in China positive growth taking hold. We're going to begin to see that across parts of East Asia. They have been more, uh, more careful and more measured in how they have dealt with COVID-19. In the United States, the situation is going to be a lot, lot trickier. I mean, the impact of COVID-19 took the American unemployment rate from the lowest it had been in 50 years to the highest it had been in over a century in the space of uh, 90 days. And so the turnaround was dramatic and no company was prepared for that. There's going to be a lot of shaking out of that structure going forwards. And I hate to do this to you again, but I'll just one further question. In terms of, you touched on China's economic uh, recovery trajectory, and uh, the second quarter numbers were surprisingly good. Uh, third quarter numbers um, looming better. Um, mm -hmm. In the battle uh, for economic recovery, is China winning the race uh, against A, the US, and B, let's call it the rest of the West? Yeah, I think most forecasts, in terms of just the crude numbers alone, suggests yes. Mm. The big question mark is the sustainability of this, given the trade war, given the trade conflict, geopolitical uh, competition, rivalry, and technology. Because Huawei will no longer be able to purchase chips the way that they used to. They are desperately scrambling to rebuild their technology. A lot of other Chinese tech companies are coming under scrutiny. There's a lot of robust strength that China has been building uh, in terms of its, its knowledge, its research and development, there's now having the, the rug pulled out from under it. You know, the, the playing field is no longer level and it's a, it's a dangerous landscape going forwards. So when Biden looks to, um, let's call it um, the Asia-Pacific or the Indo-Pacific, through an economic lens, um, he's going to see uh, an economic recovery where China is doing relatively well. Um, where America is lagging, but where the sustainability of the Chinese recovery and future growth may encounter unanticipated uh, bumps in the road because of the intensity of the decoupling in certain domains which is occurring. I'm paraphrasing you here. Um, you've, you've mentioned tech yeah. and, uh, and Huawei. Yeah, no, and no, beyond I, that... I, I don't disagree. Yeah, and beyond that... I don't disagree. We, yeah. And beyond that, one other factor I think uh, to draw from your comments is uh, a U.S. Well, president, which... A, a U.S. president, which will also face a region 
um, and in fact, a wider world where there is still a large question mark over what happens with the future of corporate debt and the future stability of financial institutions. So on his economics and finance in train, well beyond what he faces in terms of US domestic economic recovery, these fragilities across our region as well, if that's a fair rendition of what you've said. That, that, that's absolutely right. The only thing I might add is the hawkishness of both candidates against China uh, actually is quite nuanced. Uh, mm. Trump is quite comfortable with Xi Jinping, thinks he's a great guy. There's a personal affinity between the two of them. Uh, Trump has gone on record saying that he thinks that you know, the Uyghur situation in Xinjiang was the right thing to do. At the same time, he's surrounded by voices in an administration who are convinced that we're in a once in a generation life and death struggle with China. Mm. Biden, inherit, Biden shares some of that, but on the other hand, Biden will probably be quite willing to cooperate on global environmental sustainability issues where China again has a lead in, the, you know, in some of the governance structures. So there's the possibility of, of, of collaboration and cooperation at least with Biden. Mm -hmm. With Trump and his people, I think there's much more of a willful randomness and uncertainty that's been injected by a number of personalities in that camp. Mm. Well, let's come back to the question later on in our discussion of um, the $6,000 question, which is US-China. Um, and what I've sought to do so far is um, not to make US-China central to our conversation about everything and to start, in fact, with the pan-regional economy in Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, Dion, um, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, what has not been in the news recently, um, apart from the 75th anniversary of the founding of the DPRK uh, and yet another enormous parade with yet another enormous set of missiles on the back of trucks, um, what hasn't been uh, in the news recently is uh, North Korea itself more generally and um, what is actually happening uh, in terms of the North Korean nuclear program uh, during this period of, shall we say, stalled negotiations between Pyongyang and Washington uh, and Seoul on the future uh, of the peninsula. So, Dion, give us uh, uh, an update on that and what will be uh, if uh, President Biden, and Vice President Biden becomes President Biden, what will be the uh, core questions he will face on North Korea policy um, if he's elected to come this November? Over to you, Dion. Well, first, thank you so much uh, to the Asia Society for um, having me share my views with such a distinguished panel. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, what is not and has not been covered with this big parade um, is that North Korea is actually in the absence of a real nuclear agreement, in the absence of continued negotiations, is still building and perfecting and making nuclear weapons. Uh, and that's, you know, I think we should take that as a fact. And I think their parade actually symbolically showed, uh, it was a, a clear message to the world that while Kim Jong-un's speech was very low key and tried not to provoke Trump, uh, the military parade spoke volumes. Uh, it showcased a range of missiles and types uh, that uh, can basically, uh, the message is that he can target South Korea, that these missiles, newer and greater and bigger ones, are more maneuverable, and that it would be harder for the United States to preempt, preemptively strike these missiles or to intercept them. And so I think the actions spoke louder than words. And so, uh, you know, again, I, I can't help but go back to the fact that there is no real agreement uh, when Trump accepted the biggest problem, I think, fundamentally was, well, first, not having a clear strategy to, to, to um, support symmetry. But in Singapore, he basically accepted everything he wanted in terms of the content, the language, and the sequence of the negotiations that we see in the actual Singapore agreement. Uh, but, you know, after that, another problem that we're facing, we have been facing, and still are, uh, is that North Korea continues to refuse to return to negotiations until 
its demands are met first. And, I, and in the beginning, it used to be uh, if and when the United States lifts UN Security Council sanctions or five key, uh, key of the uh, five key sanctions, uh, and then it evolved into, and this is based on North Korea's public comments, it evolved into also if you lift, if you halt all US South Korea joint military exercises, but now, his sister, Kim Yo-jong, has recently expanded the scope to mean even negative rhetoric, like calling them uh, a rogue state and whatnot. And so that all has to be met first before North Korea uh, will, it would be willing to return to the negotiations table. Uh, and so, you know, if, to answer your other question, if uh, Vice President Biden is elected uh, president, he faces a very tough road ahead. Uh, North Korea's nuclear weapons capability will be far more advanced and sophisticated than it was four years ago or even a year ago. Uh, future negotiations uh, could become more complicated if Pyongyang resumes the full range of missile and weapons tests in the period between election victory and inauguration day, because Kim Jong-un might think that Trump uh, will not and cannot retaliate physically in that short time frame. Uh, but even without such actions during that period, uh, actions which North Korea might take to gain leverage ahead of any future talks with an incoming Biden administration, negotiations will still be difficult to resume if again, Pyongyang continues to uh, base its, you know, it, to, to have preconditions to lift all US, what it calls hostile US policy against it before it returns to the negotiating table. Uh, and finally, you know, the other difficulty that a future President Biden would face uh, is that you know, breaking the diplomatic stalemate uh, will be problematic if North Korea you know, maintains that maximalist position that it will not do anything unless Washington entertained its proposal it put on the table in Hanoi, which was it would offer shuttering its young nuclear complex in exchange for um, the lifting of some key Security Council sanctions. And so, uh, you know, when you ask what um, Vice President Biden's future North Korea policy would be, um, you know, I think, you know, it, it's clear that there's still, they would still be ironing out the details of what his future policy would be. But if we just look at some of Vice President Biden's uh, public comments and public quotes that he's made, um, you know, it, he has stated that his ultimate goal is denuclearization of North Korea. Uh, which includes the prevention of Pyongyang's nuclear weapons proliferation. But he also emphasizes, you know, wanting to work with diplomatically and in coordination with American allies and even China. Uh, and so another key issue that he's also talked about publicly is his willingness to tighten sanctions until North Korea gives up uh, all of its nuclear weapons programs. And but he, he has stressed before publicly, like he wants to see the right formula set for the lifting of sanctions or, or when sanctions relief should come. And so, you know, I, I think in terms of, you know, how Northeast Asian allies, America's allies and partners would see those, I think um, they would feel more reassured in a Biden style uh, North Korea policy because they would be more confident that it would have an actual strategy and actual plan. Uh, but at the same time, I think there are questions as to whether um, a future President Biden would be willing to meet with the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, because uh, that seems to be now the new norm for the past few years with Trump. And the question really is, would Kim Jong-un want to um, continue negotiations below the leader level? I would think that um, when you look at the personalities uh, likely to make up a Biden administration, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, uh, folks like that, uh, these guys are going to have a pretty traditional view of North Korea uh, in terms of the essential nature of the nuclear challenge. In contrast to the novel approach of uh, President Trump, which has kind of been a triumph of a Barnum and Bailey circus routine, uh, a predisposition for the photo opportunity rather than anything approaching a genuine strategy. Um, I mean, we're all entertained at Panmun John. We thought um, uh, Kim Jong-un discovering the delights of Singapore by night uh, was all terrific stuff, um, entertaining in the extreme. Uh, but it took all the pressure off the DPRK politically and diplomatically, and most critically, relieved China uh, of the pressure it had been under. 
uh, as uh, North Korea's single ally or single long-standing ally uh, to, to deliver anything approaching a real nuclear result. So just a few metrics, uh, Dion, if I could trouble you on this. Um, uh, what's your estimation of where the North Korean uh, nuclear arsenal has gone from and to over the last four years in terms of numbers of uh, nuclear bombs or, uh, or a bomb's equivalent? Plus, where do you think their missile development has gone from and to over the last four years, given you've had an absence of testing um, uh, on, uh, on both for the last couple of years at least? You know, well, we've seen um, some, we've seen them test a, a series of weapons, um, and it's, it's clear that that's their goal, that that's where they're trying to get to, uh, which is to perfect the technology to have operational, functional, and reliable short, medium, and long-range ballistic missiles. And so uh, I think this parade also just showcased, underscored that um, both the existing capability, but also its, um, its intent to go as far as perfecting the technology for that mega, the, the, the mother of all ICPMs that we've seen so far uh, in, the, in the parade, the grand finale that they have unveiled um, of the longest and biggest ICBM that they have. Um, and I think that that's um, a clear sign that that's where they're, they want to be headed. Now, the question is, will they um, actually resume ICBM testing to perfect that goal. Uh, and that's where there's a big question mark. I think uh, during President Trump's presidency, uh, it, I think the chances are very high that North Korea will refrain from ICBM and nuclear tests. Uh, now, again, if President Biden was elected, I think that window after uh, uh, election day uh, is questionable. If President Trump is reelected, um, you know, I would guess that North Korea might refrain from ICBM tests and continue its usual you know, short range submarine launch ballistic missiles and, and other sorts of um, gray zone type of provocations uh, because apparently President Trump has um, made it clear to Kim Jong Un in his, in his meetings uh, that his red line really is ICBM. Now, this poses a huge problem for American allies. South Korean Japan, because while you know ICBMs are definitely concerning for South Korean Japan, because it would be if they pose a threat to the United States, uh, the parade actually showed that North Korea has all these weapons that can target South Korean Japan, uh, and they've got that existing capability as well. And so, and the type of short-range missiles that they're building are the kinds that can evade and confound missile defenses, and that are harder, hard for American for um, U.S. to to try to intercept or preempt. And so, uh, you know, the, all this emphasis about Trump's red line on ICBMs is very concerning to America's allies and to Americans living in South Korea and Japan, because it makes them feel like um, Trump just disregards the lives and the security of American allies in North East Asia. Yeah, it does strike me that uh, notwithstanding the fact that we've just um uh, been going through a genuine black swan event with COVID-19 and its impact on the global economy and global politics. But looking to the next four years, uh, this uh, continuing black or grey swan called the North Korean nuclear breakout always looms as something which could uh, leap out of the shadows as the classic geopolitical uncertainty factor which torpedoes any ac economic recovery and underpinning stability, which uh, Danny was talking about before. Um, now, uh, Bali, the rest of Asia, of course, is stable and secure, and there's not a problem anywhere else. It's only in Northeast Asia that we have these difficulties. And Southeast Asia, as we know, is a zone of peace and cooperation. Zopfan, remember that? Um, but uh, let's go to the other part of uh, this uh, wonderful wide region of which uh, we Australians are just um, a southern annexure. Um, uh, your specialisations, um, Central Asia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, tell me the lens through which um, the, any change administration would be viewed there. I saw, for example, the Taliban were reported recently as coming out and providing a public endorsement for President Trump. I'm not sure that was entirely welcomed by the Republican National Committee, but over to you, Ali. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Kevin, and thank you, Asia Society, for inviting me to this session. 
Uh, you know, for uh, the uh, Trump administration's approach uh, to uh, Central Asia, Southwest Asia, and Middle East uh, have all uh, sort of been a bit uh, disjointed in the sense that at, at one level he reflected the republic, the segment of Republican Party's sentiment that they wanted out of wars, and uh, he made this promise during the campaign that he's going to bring troops back home, not just from Afghanistan, but also Iraq, Syria, and he wasn't going to get involved in wars. On the other hand, he has actually pushed very hard into the region, particularly with coming out of the Iran nuclear deal and putting Iran under maximum pressure. And uh, so we have a number of issues, key issues going on in the region. So one is the Afghanistan talks. So he took the bold step of actually sitting down with um, uh, with uh, uh, the Taliban and, and agreeing uh, on a on a U.S. withdrawal uh, agreement, uh, uh, but he hasn't been able to uh, actually bring the Afghan government and the Taliban into any kind of a political agreement about the future of Afghanistan. And uh, as we're talking, the Doha talks uh, have have ground to a halt. Uh, and if there, there is no resolution before uh, elections, and let's say if there's a Biden administration, I think we have a hanging question as to whether uh, the United States would slow down any talk of leaving Afghanistan and would uh, uh, basically ground down into another prolonged ongoing uh, co confrontation with the Taliban until there's such an agreement. And I think the Taliban sentiment about wanting Trump to continue is because they are worried about Biden uh, you know, tilting towards staying the course in Afghanistan, at least the, 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 until the Taliban makes serious concessions to the Afghan government. On the other hand, the, the Iran issue is much more problematic. Um, the Trump administration's Iran policy has failed. And they have put a tremendous amount of pressure on Iran. They've proven that you can impose sanctions on a country effectively, but they have only made Iran more dangerous. They have made the Middle East more dangerous. And there is no new nuclear deal with Iran on the horizon right now. And the Iranians are not budging until they see who's going to be the next American president. And in the meantime, I think uh, Trump's language with Iran, uh, which is particularly caustic, and the killing of uh, the Iranian General Soleimani has now sort of uh, taken away any political cover in Iran, essentially to even talk to Trump. So he's basically torpedoed his own agenda of bringing the Iranians to the table, even for a North Korea style for for, for opportunity. And then in the rest of the region, uh, you know, they are convinced that Trump is hard on Iran. Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Israel, these countries who want a hard policy on Iran see Trump as very aggressive on Iran, but, they all, but they're not convinced that the American policy is sustainable or that Trump would sustain it. So either they're gonna end up in war with Iran, which nobody in the region wants, or he's gonna end up talking to Iran, which these countries don't want either. And they see the Trump strategy essentially unsustainable. I think under Biden, the region will see a, a, a much more coherent effort of how is it that the United States is going to disengage from the region. So a much more coherent diplomatic strategy to end the war in Yemen, to uh, deal with Afghanistan, to end the war in Syria. And also the idea of going back to the Iran nuclear deal as a way of lowering the temperature uh, with, the, um, with the region. But either way, I think the region is preparing itself for a much smaller American footprint. On the other hand, connecting this conversation to the other part of Asia, it's very clear that China is having a bigger uh, presence in the region. If the United States indeed ends up leaving Afghanistan, uh, the Chinese are, uh, uh, through their investment in Pakistan and now the, the talk of a strategic partnership with Iran and potentially even uh, uh, investments of Belt and Road in Turkey uh, are likely to be a much bigger presence on that corridor that connects Central Asia to the uh, Arabian Sea. And uh, the Trump administration actually has responded very uh, uh, tersely to the idea of a strategic partnership between Iran and, and, and China, of, of the Chinese making big investments in Iran. Uh, and also there's now a lot of talk about the Chinese supporting a Saudi nuclear program. So whoever becomes president of the United States uh, will have to deal with a, with a China that is a bigger presence uh, in West Asia. Uh, I think the Trump administration is already signaling 
that they, that they view this as a threat to the United States and they're going to deal with it uh, in the same vein as they have dealt with China's presence in uh, uh, on, on on East Asia. But this is this is an open question. In other words, we really don't know what are uh, what is the extent of Chinese investments in Iran, for instance. Uh, how is it going to unfold, whether it has a military dimension, as it's been reported by, by, by many in Iran, and ultimately, what are the strategic objectives of China? So, so uh, you know, that's also a question that is hanging over the region as, uh, as a new administration comes in. It's quite interesting that if we had this conversation 10 years ago, or even five years ago, and we said uh, that the future of the wider Middle East uh, would also be shaped um, by um, uh, the future dynamics of the US-China relationship, uh, most of us would have been laughed out of the room because China was not a strategic factor or real consequence in that subregion at that time. Things have changed. Let me probe you one step further, mm -hmm. Bali, before we go to a more general conversation about US-China. And that is when uh, you say that, for example, that through the BRI, um, China is um, uh, likely uh, to begin investing significantly in Turkey. Uh, interesting, uh, given uh, the Xinjiang-Turkic uh, connection, um, the historical relationship, um, which I now we now call historical, going back uh, in its current incarnation, the last seven years, um, and that is with Russia. Uh, and the, uh, also the historical depth uh, and breadth of the relationship with Tehran. Uh, if these are emerging China relationships, uh, it doesn't yet seem to be uh, resulting in a binary reaction on the part of the Gulf monarchies or Israel for that matter against China. Uh, the UAE, Saudi, the Israelis uh, all have direct equities in China, um, significant trade, co-investment, um, and of course, in the case of the two uh, Gulf monarchies I just mentioned, them effectively replacing the United States as the principal purchaser of, um, of Gulf hydrocarbons. So this normal binary which, uh, which applies uh, when we look at uh, US-China uh, doesn't seem to be at this stage uh, dividing, as it were, uh, the region uh, between China and the United States, uh, do you think, to use the English expression, uh, the Gulf monarchies and everyone else think they can have their cake and eat it too? Your, your reflections on that, Bali? Well, uh, you know, uh, uh, Iran, Turkey, and the Gulf monarchies, as, as much as they are, ri uh, they are rivals of one another, when it comes to India, China, and Russia, they don't act in a binary way, largely because those great powers don't act in a binary way. So the Russians deal on OPEC with Saudi Arabia, on Syria with Iran. They have good relations with Turkey on some things and not on others. India similarly has very strong um, trade ties with, with, uh, uh, with, had trade ties with Iran and then also had trade ties with Saudi Arabia and the like. And also, you know, the issue of the Uyghurs and Xinjiang, we have to also note that Arabs, Iranians and the Turks have not said anything about Kashmir either. In fact, mm -hmm. the UAE gave, a, gave a, uh, the highest award of that country to Prime Minister Modi right in the middle of the Kashmir crackdown. Uh, and, and so, so in a way, the, 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 uh, contrary to perceptions outside the, the geopolitics of the Middle East, maybe Islamic on the surface, but in reality is, is, is great power politics. Now, I, it, a lot of it depends on exactly how the Chinese, uh, what kind of signalings they get. I, I think until now, much like the Russians, the, the Chinese signal to these capitals have been that your accounts are separate from one another. So mm. we're willing to put $56 billion into, into Pakistan, but our account with India, whether we increase trade with India or whether we have a border uh, you know, clash with India has nothing to do with Pakistan. And at the same mm. time as they're negotiating with Iran about a mega strategic partnership, they also were helping Saudi Arabia develop a nuclear, nuclear uh, capability. And I think the countries in the region have also realized that they cannot own Beijing anymore that they can own Moscow. So this, this is a peculiarity of American politics that sees everything black and white and it tries to force everybody into a team. So hmm. whereas I think that Chinese inclination, Russian inclination is very different. And I think if their footprint in the Middle East becomes bigger, Middle East would be a more peaceful place. 
because the Chinese do not want to sort of separate Iran and Saudi Arabia. In fact, they probably would like the Iran and the Saudis to get along better so that they could do business with both sides. They don't want to have to choose. Mm. So, so the, the sum total is that the, the more we see China arrive in the Middle East, I think the more complicated Middle East politics is going to become. It's not, it's not going to look anything like, like, like what we have been used to for decades of American presence in the region and the way in which the United States has divided the region and defined who's a friend and who's an enemy. These are fascinating observations in terms of uh, the various countries of the wider Middle East uh, not accepting, as it were, the binary template. Lots of nods from Danny uh, reflecting on Southeast Asian realities there uh, in terms of uh, we'd really rather not choose between these 2,000 pound gorillas in the, uh, in the living room. Um, so, but let me turn to the gorillas in question, um, uh, China and the United States, because there is, whether we like it or not, a significant uh, thematic uh, thread uh, across um, uh, all three of, let's call it, the sub-regions we've been speaking about. And I suppose, uh, let me um, pose this question to each of you in sequence, and I'll go through the same order. Uh, we've got about, um, I think, about a quarter of an hour or so left uh, in our conversation. So let's try and keep it uh, as sharp as we can. Uh, Danny, your thoughts on, uh, if we're looking out uh, four years uh, on US-China, to what extent does that become the primary uh, dynamic uh, governing the future of peace and economic development in Southeast Asia? Uh, and then I will reflect that question uh, both to Northeast Asia and to the other regions which you've just spoken of, Bali. But over to you, Danny. Uh, thank you, Kevin. F fascinating conversation. On the, you're trying to look four years out, I suspect that the hardening of the American elite position against China is set at this point. We're not going to see a sharp turnaround. And, and in some ways, from the, from the Southeast Asian perspective, it's all a little bit puzzling. I mean, yes, there are concerns about business practice, intellectual property theft, and all of that, and, and that needs to be worked out. That affects everybody. But a lot of America's rhetoric in its narrative against China uh, pays lip service to that, but then quickly glides over to these existential questions about, you know, does China's rise pose a threat to our very way of life? Uh, you know, Trump himself, you know, is concerned about just the trade balance and politicizing COVID-19 so that he comes out looking in a good light. Um, China does not want to play this kind of game and it continues to tell the high road narrative it continues to of course talk is cheap we all know that mm. but it does continue to tell the story of how we're in a win-win we're looking for win-win situate outcomes there's a there's you know mutual prosperity shared destiny uh, we want societies to be open we look at our system as something that's precisely with Chinese characteristics, meaning it works for us, not for anybody else. And it's very difficult to square the narrative that's emerging from, from the United States with what we actually hear coming from China. This is not to say we're sanguine about the increasing musculature and assertiveness of the mm. great power, rising great power. It's something that we all watch out for. But the, the narrative now, America has been so successful for the last century, partly because it's got this immense hard power, but also partly because it told a good story. Hmm. Its soft power journey was persuasive, and it seems to not want to make any effort anymore in that direction. And that's puzzling, that it's throwing away something that has been so successful for it. Hmm. So this, the, from the perspective of Southeast Asia, what we're seeing is this, this emergence of a different narrative. Uh, as far as Southeast Asia is concerned, our number one trading partner is China. It's the number one trading partner for almost all economies. So America really needs to up its game, it seems to me. And right now, there does not seem to be a good narrative coming out of either of the presidential candidates. Let me leave it at that, if I may, Kevin. I'm happy to jump back mm. in, but that's roughly the outline of how I see no, it. No, that's a, that's a fascinating observation. Um, uh, who would have thought that in the year 2020, uh, we would say that the China story is uh, more persuasive than the American story? 
uh, in terms of, uh, let's call it, uh, the future, not just of the sub-region, but the wider region. Um, it always strikes me that our American friends make a huge mistake in failing to differentiate between declaratory policy and operational policy, declaratory strategy and operational strategy. It seems in the United States, the game is always uh, who can come up with the uh, zippiest, sharpest, uh, most uh, domestically, politically saleable slogan to mm -hmm. describe the latest twist in what we think could be American strategy, completely disconnected from what is actually happening on the ground, but on the way through, making everyone feel pretty anxious. Um, as opposed to what Henry Kissinger has always said to me in his very grave terms, um, is that, uh, Kevin, uh, why doesn't America just do these things and not talk about them? Um, <laughs> in uh, this kind of um, adversarial way. So um, I, I think there's a lot of wisdom in your reflections there, uh, Danny. Uh, to you, uh, Dion, the, on the question of Northeast Asia, and particularly the three-way relationships that you specialise in, uh, the P Korean Peninsula, Japan-China, to what extent is the uh, US-China relationship, again for the next four years, the binary determinant of where the region goes. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, so I think that also ties in with the question of who would win in November as well. So uh, Northeast Asians, especially South Koreans and many Japanese, uh, there's a lot of um, concern that regardless of who wins in November, uh, their security concerns will still remain. Uh, as they have been for several decades, actually. And so fundamentally, it's really um, questions surrounding uh, US, the US extended deterrent or you know, US security commitment to its Northeast Asian allies. And so this question and these doubts have existed, they've increased over time, but many South Koreans that I have spoken to and also many Japanese say that they call it the Trump factor. So the Trump factor has exasperated their concerns and their doubts. Uh, but even if there's a Biden administration, uh, many of these people that I've spoken to uh, point, their, their perception is that the, Ameri the broader American national security establishment and the broader American public prefers America look more inward and to stop and, and to refrain from and dial back from being the so-called global police of the world or the peacekeeper of the world. And so, uh, that for South Korean Japan is concerning. And so this is where you hear these discussions still on the fringe, but you hear these discussions of, um, you know, temptations to want to have their own, for example, their own nuclear weapons or, or, or talks about even very recently, you heard um, the South Korean ambassador to the United States say publicly, uh, or, or actually in a government audit, uh, that you know, South Korea has gotten big enough that it you know it can just choose. It doesn't have to always be tied to or feel obligated to be tied to the United States. And so, uh, I think those fundamental security concerns are there. The U.S.-China um, rivalry, of course, has um, impl implications for Northeast Asia. You've got Northeast Asian countries who are worried that they are, for example, with the South Korea, especially that they're. Their, their land, their country might become the actual battleground of great power rivalry uh, and another conflict. Of course, there's concern across the um, East China Sea and of course the Taiwan Strait as well. So, to, so these concerns that there might actually be physical conflict in the region is a top concern. But at the same time, you know, I, I agree with um, Professor Kwa's um, assessment uh, and the theme that you raise and how Asians view not such a big difference between Biden or Trump in their narratives and in what they're thinking and their advisors are thinking. Uh, and so in this sense, uh, there are many North, uh, South, East, South Koreans and many Japanese who, you know, they actually like Trump's toughness, but they're worried about it. It's, it's, it's a bit too crazy, you know? And then they question whether Biden would be tough enough against China. Uh, and so, you know, they want an American president, whoever it is, to be tough on China to a certain extent, but not tip the scale where, uh, you know, there might be some conflicts, physical conflict in the region, and not to the extent where uh, they're, they're, they have to choose and, be, and feel they're pulled between these two giants. And so they, they basically want a unicorn American president, you know, but, and this is a very delicate and tough issue for the next president, whether it's Trump, whether it's Biden.
So, uh, yeah, so Northeast Asia wants a three bears, uh, Goldilocks and the three bears, US president. Not too hot, not too cold, but just right. Am I, have I got it straight? Um, <laughs> it's, it's a tough ask in geopolitics, but we'll work on it. The, um, I'm mindful of the fact that we've got five or six minutes left. Vali, if I could keep you down to two or three minutes. On the binary again of US-China, could you reflect on us again on a, over the next four years, where this will land, do you think, India, Pakistan, and their respective relationships uh, with uh, Beijing and Washington? Uh, it's, uh, I think for now, the, the assumption is that uh, uh, it's, it's right now it's not playing a very direct role. The Pakistanis are much more nervous because uh, generally to the theme that we were talking, the US-China rivalry is only arriving in West Asia. It's first arriving in the sense of you can't have Huawei and, and you can't have these investments, but, but the perception is that China's appetite and strategic interest will make it a bigger player. And then, uh, you know, th this region can get caught between uh, a United States that's going to demand less Chinese investment, less Chinese imports, less Chinese engagement, and China that more than likely is going to be more assertive in terms of, uh, of uh, what it wants. I think the Chinese have not indicated that they wanna get in the middle of regional conflicts, but they will probably flex their muscles when it comes to American pressure of forcing countries to give up uh, uh, on, on, on China. But I would also say that the, the, the region, even countries that like Trump have now seen the other side of America. So even if Biden comes in, he can slow this process, but after Biden, there might be a repetition of Trump. So countries are much less willing to basically bite back into the American apple and, uh, and, and, and are want to hedge with China a lot more. And I think that does give China a certain advantage in terms of uh, this rivalry for uh, going, going down, looking at next four years. Particularly at the end of four years, the question is who's gonna be the American president after the first term of Biden? Hmm. The, um, that's a fascinating point in terms of a deep regional realism about uh, the nature of the American political process, given that the essential bipartisan uh, posture of previous Republican Democratic administrations towards uh, China and Asia uh, has come apart, as has the previous bipartisan posture on, let's call it, vigorous American global and regional engagement versus a Trumpian notion of selective retreat, my words, not the administration's. Uh, that's a fascinating insight in terms of the hedge in the reverse direction. In the few minutes we've got uh, remaining, I'm going to pose you all the very difficult question and you can duck and weave and avoid answering if you like, but uh, I'll then give a prize out for who does the duck and weave most diplomatically. Uh, the uh, and we Australians are notoriously uh, non-duckers and weavers. In fact, I'm often told that the words Australian and diplomacy never belong in the same sentence uh, properly. So, and our Singaporean friends particularly think that because they know us so well. Um, but here's a question. If you're sitting in the Standing Committee of the Politburo at the moment, who do you want to win, uh, Trump or Biden? Um, and uh, I'll, I'll let Danny think a little bit first. Uh, and this gives you, I think, um, just under a minute each. So who do you think they want to win? And give me a couple of reasons why that's that's your pick in terms of what China would want. Uh, starting with you, Dion. I think they would want President Trump to win, especially when they see Trump, um, you know, basically take a transactional approach to alliances, uh, you know, and that's basically what in the Northeast Asian context they want, um, you know, a waning, waning U.S. influence, eventual, you know, um, reduction and withdrawal of U.S. presence in the region. And so, and, that, and that's exactly what, you know, North Korea wants, Russia wants. Uh, and even, you know, some, some circles within the South Korean progressive um, base, some of them are not um, entirely opposed to eventually, I mean, of course, when the conditions are right, but eventually that scenario. And so, um, and especially when Trump is taking his approach with North Korea, you know, in terms of regional order, I think this is where 
um, China sure. might believe that Trump is actually helping Beijing win in the, in the okay. global game. That's fairly clear. Yeah, you get um, nine out of 10 on the Australian candor scale. Uh, Vali, over to you. Um, uh, who, do, who does who do the, uh, the Politburo want to win? I, I think initially they probably wanted Trump to win because he was reducing America's global footprint and, and uh, weaken America's position in Asia. But I, but I think right now, uh, I think they would probably want Biden to win largely because I think the direction U.S.-China uh, relations are going is no longer up to Trump. He's bringing in an, a bureaucracy that is really driving this relationship to collapse. At one point, two months ago, there was, there was an open question whether the embassy in Washington might be open by, by December. Uh, and, and I think there's some stability in this relationship is now necessary. It's becoming too erratic even for, for Chinese planning. There's those, uh, again, very insightful comments and reflect in part my own uh, dealings with uh, various Chinese think tanks. And now, Danny, give us the great Singaporean hedge and where you think, uh, uh, who do you think Beijing would like to, uh, to win? Yeah, I too think that Beijing would like Biden to win. And it used to be Trump because it was better the devil that you know. But this is a devil that's become erratic, unpredictable, will turn on you when he feels that it suits him. Biden will move slower, more ploddingly. I, and as a member of the Politburo, I do not want to be criticized for my approach to human rights and liberal values. But on the other hand, this is somebody I can sit across a negotiating table with and talk sense, talk mm -hmm. rational sense. So I think they would like to go with Biden. <laughs> Uh, and let me put my own views on the table as well, given that we have one vote uh, for Trump, um, we have one vote for Biden, and Vali sitting elegantly on the fence, although with a time sequence, which puts him more in the Biden camp. I'm still with the Trump vote, and uh -huh. there I'm reflecting the views of the, I think, the Chinese national security and foreign policy establishment, which is closer to the party centre. And the reason is... In China domestically, given the first priority of the Chinese regime is survival, uh, Trump is such a bad advertisement for democracy around the world and within China itself uh, because of, let's call it, his peculiar behaviour. Uh, we may see more of that in the days following uh, Election Day. Uh, Danny Kwa, Vali Nasa and uh, Dion Kim, thank you so much for joining us uh, in this fascinating discussion about... Um, looking at the American elections from the region out uh, and what to expect if there is a change in administration. I really do value your time and your insights, and we hope to continue this series as we approach uh, the event in, uh, in November. And uh, let's hope uh, it is a, um, a clear outcome one way or the other.